And as Maria mentioned today, I'll be speaking about um, trying to answer that question of if you're heard, is mycoplasma how pneumonia negative? And we will be walking through um, a study that we did that's trying to get the answer as best as we can answer with the tools that are available. Before I start today, I'd like to um, acknowledge the rest of the investigators they worked with. It was definitely a team effort for this study. And um, specifically, Dr. Eduardo Fano and Dr. Dale Polson from BI. Um, for helping with the design of the study and analysis, and then also Dr. Polson for using his stochastic model that we'll walk through. In addition, Kent Doolittle um, at the BI Health Management Center in the lab to help on the lab side of the design of the study um, and running those PCRs. Uh, CJ Fitzgerald was a, um, a student intern with us from Iowa State that helped run that stochastic model and once I get into that, you'll see why we had some additional help. And then finally, Maria Peters for her guidance um, in the study design and analysis. So as an overview for the talk today, I'll start off with um, a take-home message with the two main points from the study. We'll go through some background information, uh, the objective for the study. We'll talk about what is stochastic modeling uh, before we get into that portion of the study. Uh, we'll talk through materials and methods, applications for how this could be applied and is being applied in the field, and then finally the conclusions from the study. So the two big take-home messages from our study was that these sampling guidelines have been developed specifically for mycoplasma how pneumonia. So they take into account having um, a non-perfect diagnostic sampling procedure, so different from you know, the Canon and Row tables developed in 1982 or any of the online calculators you might use. Uh, they take into, some, into account some of the limitations that we face. They also look at uh, the number of times to sample a group of animals, which is important for mycoplasma how pneumonia because of the slow spread of the bacteria in a population. And secondly, um, the second take-home message from the study is that the number of animals that are sampled are based on the risk that you're willing to assume. So again, there isn't um, necessarily a magic number of animals to sample and number of times to sample them, but as you sit down and understand everything that goes into uh, these sampling guidelines, you can make that choice for the risk that you're um, willing to, to take as you're deciding what you want to sample. So mycoplasma how pneumonia continues to be an important issue in the swine industry, uh, with Dr. Yeski estimating the cost to be uh, $3.65 per groin pig, with a range of $2 to $10, depending on co-infections. And for that reason, many farms have chosen to undergo elimination or are um, in the process um, of doing those eliminations or having conversations about eliminating from specific farms or their systems. We know that diagnostics are challenging, especially in the live animal for mycoplasma how pneumonia. However, novel sample types um, suggest a higher diagnostic sensitivity. And there's been several studies recently that have looked at the sample procedure comparison for PCR. The first one, the French study in 2010, compared um, nasal swabs to an oral pharyngeal swab and a tracheal bronchial washing and a tracheal bronchial catheter and showed the tracheal bronchial catheter to have the highest diagnostic sensitivity. Now in 2013, Peters and Rivera um, also looked at a nasal swab, oral fluids, um, a laryngeal swab, and then the tracheal bronchial lavage and found the laryngeal swab to be the most sensitive. Now in 2015, we had a BI student intern with Swine Vet Center, a Chris Sievers, that looked at the two results from both of those studies, the tracheal bronchial catheter and the laryngeal swab, and compared those to a post-mortem bronchial swab. And in his study, he found that the tracheal bronchial catheter and the laryngeal swab, the two um, live animal sampling procedures, had a similar diagnostic sensitivity. However, when we went out to the field to train um, farm personnel on collections, we felt that the laryngeal swab was a little bit easier for um, technicians or farm staff to collect. And for that reason, that was the sample type that, um, that their group chose to implement in the field. 
And of course, the next obvious question once you settle on your sampling procedure is, okay, can I pool those samples? So with Chris's study, we added on a second phase and we looked at the effect of pooling on the diagnostic sensitivity. And we found that as you increase your sample size with pooling, you would increase your HER detection rate and save dollars. However, when we took this information and tried to apply it to multiple scenarios and we're getting questions about sampling in low prevalence herds, we had concerns about using this information because of the population that we collected from. In Chris's study, we collected from a GDU that had been, um, the gilts had been actively exposed to mycoplasma hound ammonia. We had more than one positive in a pool. And with pooling, um, your CT value should matter. So for that reason, we decided to design the next study that had two different phases. The first looked at pooling on diagnostic sensitivity. And this, for this phase, we took a lab-based approach, and I'll talk through why we did that. And then the second phase of the study was developing sampling guidelines using a stochastic model, using a stochastic model to determine the number of animals that would need to be sampled. So our objective for phase one was to determine the effective pooling um, of laryngeal swab samples on mycoplasma hound ammonia detection in low prevalence populations. And again, um, this was our lab-based portion of our study. We chose to use artificial samples because as we started talking through the design of our study, we realized um, the high numbers that we would need for the power of the study, uh, the volume that we would need, and we just didn't have enough samples from the field or could collect enough for all of the different um, cycle time values that we wanted to look at. So for that reason, we created um, artificial samples that were composed of three different components. The first was a mycoplasma hound ammonia strain AP414 that was recently isolated from the field um, from a U.S. herd and actually was from a GDU where they had done natural exposure. The second component was oral fluids from a mycoplasma hound ammonia historically negative farm, and that was to mimic um, any potential inhibition from saliva on you know, laryngeal swab that would be collected. And then finally, we used PBS for dilution. The PCR that we used was a Life Technologies VetMax Plus PCR, and the cycle time cutoff for that was 38, so anything below 38 was considered positive. We tested 540 samples total, and we pooled those um, in pools of three and five, and again, that was chosen based off of being a typical industry standard. Now, when we were trying to decide um, the different cycle time values that we might want to look at, we chose to pull all the samples that we had at the health management center, all of the laryngeal swab samples, and create a histogram of those to look at the distribution that we see in the field. And so in total, we had 93 samples, and these ranged from various time points of, of exposure. And from this distribution, we picked three different values. We had a low CT group of 26, a medium of 31, and a high of 36. So as I mentioned um, earlier, we chose to use those artificial samples because of the power calculation that we ran and the numbers that we um, had decided that we needed. And our power calculation was done on a two-proportion test in Minitab 17 with an alpha probability of 0.05, a baseline of 0.5, the power of 0.8, proportion of 0.3, and the number of data points needed was 90 to be able to call a difference of 20% significant. So this table represents how we split out all of those data points for each of our cycle time values and our pools. So if you look at um, the top left of the table, the low CT value group, um, for the 5 to 1 pools, we had 90 PCRs. For the low CT value group, 3 to 1 pool, we had 90 PCRs, and then so on for our medium and high cycle time groups. We had additional space left on the plates that we were running, so we included six PCRs that would be individual positive samples for our low, medium, and high CT value groups. 
And then we also included, um, in total, we had six PCRs of individual negative samples that were just the oral fluids, composed of the oral fluids. Again, we had, for our pooling, we had one known positive sample included with either, with two or four negative samples. So the fact that we had a known positive included with the negatives um, was considered to be our gold standard within that group versus having another, um, another test run on those. So as I mentioned, we had 540 total PCRs uh, that we tested. They were distributed among six different plates with 15 PCRs per cycle time and per, po per pool run on each plate. Um, we had, we used, tested all of these on one day using three different machines, two plates per machine, and the real-time uh, PCR machine that we used was the Roche uh, Light Cycler 480. To try to reduce potential variation, we had one technician that was responsible for the amplification process and one that was responsible for the extraction. And we also um, used the same um, extraction uh, batch and lot and amplification um, lot. And as we look at this PCR plate, as I mentioned, we had each pool and CT value recorded or represented with 15 PCRs um, for each group. And so if we start in the top left um, in red, we have the pools of three uh, for our low CT group. And as you can see, there's 15 of those. And then moving to the right in black, we have pools of three, um, the medium CT value group, 15 of those. And then in green, pools of three, a high CT value group, and then um, in yellow we get into the pools of five, and so on as you move down to the right of the plate. In the very top left corner we had uh, the HMC's existing positive and negative controls that they would use um, on every plate that they run. And as I mentioned, we included a positive um, individual control for our low, medium, and high cycle time group along with our individual negative control composed of the oral fluids. So our results uh, for the first phase of the study, this table shows that the diagnostic sensitivity that, um, that was, came from the study. And as you can see, the greatest risk for missing a positive in a pool was in the high CT um, value group. So that was why we chose to focus on this group to kind of have the most conservative estimates that we used in the sampling uh, tables that we were developing. So in the very top line um, is the diagnostic sensitivity of the mean. And as we move down, we ran a 95% confidence interval um, for the pools of three and five in the high CT group and a 99% confidence interval. And I'll show you a little bit later the numbers that we pulled out of there, but this is how we determined our diagnostic sensitivities to use in these in developing the tables. So once we had those, we moved on to phase two of the study where we took that diagnostic sensitivity, assumed a diagnostic specificity of 100%, and um, our objective for this portion was to determine um, the live animal laryngeal swab sampling protocols for detection of mycoplasma, specifically for low prevalence populations. So why is this important? Well, there's, there are no specific guidelines that are currently available for mycoplasma how pneumonia testing in the field. And um, the sampling guidelines that you use need to depend on the diagnostic sensitivity um, of the te full testing procedure that you're using in addition to the herd size, detection probability that you choose, and the expected prevalence when you're determining the number of animals, but also the number of times um, that you might sample. So again, take into account that slow spread of mycoplasma in the herd. So before we get into the table development, um, I'll quickly walk through what is stochastic modeling if you haven't had um, a course by Dennis DePetri or talked with Dale Polson. Um, so basically there's deterministic and stochastic modeling. And with deterministic, you used fixed input variables. 
and your outcome is fixed output results. You're not taking into account the variability that might be naturally occurring. With stochastic modeling, on the other hand, you take into account the distributions for your input variables, and you end up with distributions for your output results. So it takes into account that variability that would be occurring so you have a more um, realistic number that you're looking at. So again, these are the results from our first study, our diagnostic sensitivities. And this is where we, this is where our numbers came from that we plugged into the model that I'll walk through. Uh, so for our high CT group pools of three, the mean was 90. We chose to use the low end of the confidence intervals of the 95% confidence intervals and the 90 and the 95% confidence intervals to be more conservative in our estimates. Um, so those were 81.9 and then 79.1, which is the number that I'll use in the next set of examples that we'll walk through. And then for pools of five, um, the same thing. We had the mean, the 95% and 99% confidence intervals. So this was a stochastic model that, again, Dale Polson developed with an Excel. And to use this model, we would first plug in a population size. So in this example, we use 2,500. Um, as you move across the right in that yellow bar, uh, we had the number of individuals that would be sampled. And for the initial tables that we developed, we used 120, 90, 60, and 30. Um, next, we would input the prevalence. And so we, had, we used a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5% prevalence in the first tables that we developed. And then um, the next number that we would put in was the diagnostic sensitivity. And this would take into account which pool you chose to use. So if you remember on that previous slide, uh, the 79.1 would be the low end of the 99% confidence interval for pools of three from that high cycle time value group. So for every um, diagnostic sensitivity that we put in, every pool, prevalence, and then number of animals to sample, um, two values would be recorded from, from this um, graphic, and it would be the 95% detection probability and the 99% detection probability. And then there were 100 iterations run for every single scenario, so that's the stochasticity part of the model um, that our student intern helped with. And then for each of those points, um, the number of sample collections needed would be recorded. So we'll walk through an example. If we were interested in detecting 95% um, or greater, we would look at the 96.2 in this example and then go down to the bottom of the graph, and that would indicate that we would need to sample that population of 90 animals pooled by three, five different times. If we were interested in 99% or greater detection probability, we would need to sample that group eight different times, pool by three. So the applications for this, we took all of those different scenarios that we created and put them into some tables for sampling guidelines. And so this table came out of that previous example looking at a population size of greater than or equal to 2,500 at the different prevalence levels, one through 5%, um, by the number of laryngeal swab samples collected and pooled by three. And this was based on that 99% lower confidence level of the diagnostic specificity. And for this specific table, we chose to have a detection probability of 95% or greater. So what this is saying is that if you choose to pool by three, if you're interested in detecting a 1% prevalence or below, and you wanted to sample 90 individuals, again, pool by three, you would need to run 20 PCRs, and you would need to collect those 60 animals, pool by three, eight different times. And you can see as you, know, as you increase the numbers that you're sampling, the number of collection time points decreases. Now the same example, if, you're, if you choose to pool by five, so five to one pools, you're in a, interested in 1% prevalence or below and a detection probability of 95% or greater. And you sampled 60 animals. If you pool by five, you would need to run 12 PCRs, but you need to collect that group of animals 11 different times. So 
that would work out to be cheaper diagnostic dollar wise. However, you have that additional labor of um, you know restraining those animals and collecting those samples. So the applications for this. Um, you know, if you have a question about is a specific population negative, this is one way to get you there with, and you would know your uh, detection probability that you would choose and, you know, what percent prevalence you might want to test down to to realize, you know, based on the risk that you're willing to assume. So potential applications for this um, is testing incoming guilts from an isolation or GDU. Uh, replacements to validate the negative status of a herd so that might be on the back end of elimination or uh, before you're opening up your herd again, or potentially testing due to wing piglets to validate lack of vertical transmission. So as with any study, there were limitations. Um, first, we used the one strain of mycoplasma how pneumonia, but we felt like we by inc by choosing different um, cycle time groups, we're able to look at different, um, you know, potentially different levels of bacterial load. We had one sample type that we were really looking at, and that was the laryngeal swab. But again, from um, the recent sampling procedure comparisons for PCR, um, that is the most live, one of the most live animal, um, most sensitive live animal diagnostic te testing techniques procedures that we have. As always, there's intralab variability, but again, we try to control for that by running all the PCRs on one day, um, limiting the number of technicians that were running those PCRs, um, and testing, you know, having representatives of every pool and CT value group on each plate, for example. Another limitation is, um, again, we're talking about sampling intervals and different collections needed, and we haven't necessarily tested um, the sampling interval time frame. However, based on what we know from mycopla about mycoplasma how pneumonia and the ecology, we are um, recommending that the laryngeal samples be collected about 30 days apart. And again, that's based off of knowing how slowly that spreads through a population, that it can take up to four weeks to see uh, clinical signs um, of infection such as coughing within a group. And so that's why we're proposing those 30 days. But again, that's something that we're working on to, to test in the field. And again, next steps, we've been um, working to validate the sampling tables in the field. We have um, kind of a, a group of tables that we've pulled together so far, but we're also working on um, developing, creating specific sampling guidelines for different scenarios, different population sizes, and we've just done those um, as a requested. So my email addresses are up there. So in conclusion, these sampling guidelines are developed specifically for mycoplasma how pneumonia. They take into account the diagnostic sensitivity of the entire testing procedure. They're not assuming a perfect test like um, you know, some of the online calculators would be. And then they also take into account the slow spread of mycoplasma how pneumonia within a herd. Um, when determining the number of sampling, using the number of um, different sampling time points to test. And then secondly, the number of animals that you sample is going to be based on the risk that you're willing to assume, what detection probability you want, um, you know, what prevalence you want to test down to.